Somebody passed away here. Let's see. Apparently, Gary Sylvester. Pastor in Abuna. Oh, okay. Yeah, he uh, he was the previous pastor at Buna. Praise the Lord, old enough to die. Well, they're they're pastors. They have a new pastor. Yeah, he's been there forever. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's hard. Scriptural priorities. We're going to start kind of a new series, I guess. I don't know how far we'll go, but scriptural priorities. Boy, that's a long list, isn't it? Prior, scriptural, spiritual growth, priorities of spiritual growth, right? It's kind of what we do in Equip for Life. I always tell our students that we have, um, if there were 20 lessons, only 20 if you could choose, just 20 lessons, that could teach a person how to live for God, and, you know, there's more than 20. How many are there? Hundreds and thousands of lessons. But if you just pick 20, um, that would make up our 20 lessons of our Quit for Life class. So they're very important. And uh, this one, this, so this is kind of in the same vein as that. Scriptural priorities. We're going to begin here at Matthew chapter 6, verse number 24. No one can serve two masters, for he, either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. Is life not more than food? And the body more than just clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They, ne they neither sow nor, re nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you is being anxious can add one single hour to his, life's, his span of life? And uh, why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They toil, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. In, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Everybody say that, little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, do not fear things of this world, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But, here's the priority, you ready? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day it's, is its own trouble. Praise God. I was listening to a podcast yesterday, and uh, that kind of comes to mind here as I'm reading that scripture. You know, we fear a lot of things that will happen, right? We fear circumstances. Most of the things that we fear won't ever happen, but we fear them anyway, don't we? What, what do we think about? We we imagine things in our minds, don't we? We have images. Images of, that's what imagination is. It's an image, and you formulate that image in your mind, and you begin to see all the terrible things that could happen, right? Sally's like that. When I uh, would, would be late for high school, she would think that my house burned down. And she would probably see that in her mind and flames and all that. Well, there was one day I showed up late because the house did catch on fire. Um, so that didn't help. I, I, um, I put toast in the toaster and went back to bed. And the toaster, you know, supposed to pop up when it's done, but it didn't. 
And so it caught the bottom of the cabinets on fire. Uh, I think my dad caught that and uh, put it out. I think we got white cabinets after that, maybe. Anyway, so, uh, but we, we imagine things, don't we? We have images of the terrible. And um, so, you know what? He says, do not have any images. We should not worship any other image. So when we fear another image, then we are taking our fear from God and we're placing it onto that image. So we either, we're, we're going to fear something. So we ought to fear God and not other things. He ought to be the only image. He ought to be the only thing that we focus on. And so what, what if we imagine then this is terrible, like John, he was talking about his job situation this morning, and he doesn't know whether he's going to have a job tomorrow or not, but he says, but I know God. I know God can do. And so Brother Stowe says this all the time. He always says, hey, this is that and the other, but the good news is I know God can do whatever. We don't know where we're going to live tomorrow, but I know God can make a way. So what is that? That's like I understand that we've got clothes and we've got to eat and we've got needs and we've got life things that we've got to worry about, but I have an image of what if God makes a way? Not what if the house burns down, but what if God turns this into something great? That's faith. Oh, ye of little faith, he said. No, we want to have great faith and put our faith in God. So he said if you seek first the kingdom of God, all of those other things, will be added unto you. So we're going to talk about scriptural priorities. The Webster's Dictionary defines priority as the quality or condition of being prior, precedence in time, in order, and importance. So it comes first. Prior is before everything else, right? This inner struggle that we keep talking about between this carnal man and that spiritual man this is our Jacob and our Esau that lives inside of each one of us that are at enmity with each other. Often we put, because of this carnal thought and our carnal nature, we put secondary matters first. You know, I, 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 I don't know if it was in the same podcast or another one, but I, they all run together anymore. But uh, I heard one man say th this week that um, how do you know the love that God had for Jacob versus Esau. How do you know that, that God loved Jacob more than Esau? How do you know? And he said, because he let Esau go. He let Esau live his life the way he wanted to live his life. He didn't turn him back. He didn't, but Jacob, he put him in the vice. He put him in the ringer, didn't he? He put him right on the potter's wheel and began to take stuff out and put stuff in, and that's how he knew that God loved Jacob. We took our kids, they are teenagers. When they get to be teenagers, they want to be free, don't they? They just want to be no rules, no obligations, right? Just let me go and be free. And then, oh boy, they want to break through that. I always remember what Brother Stowe said. He his dad was like that. His parents didn't really care. And he asked, he asked him, he said, well, I'm going to go out tonight. I've got all these things, homework to do, but I'm going to go out. And he said, yeah, whatever. And, and Brother Stowe says, why don't you tell me no? Right? Is that how it went? Why don't you tell me no, Dad? Where's the love? <laughs> Come on, I need some discipline. And because we recognize that as we grow older, that we recognize that, hey, the hand that keeps us uh, is the hand that keeps us. But oftentimes we put secondary matters first while regulating the things of God in some spare time project. Uh, so sometimes we categorize our walk with God as a spare time project. It becomes more of a hobby, uh, maybe a avid hobby, but still a hobby in the same. While our intentions may be noble and we want to walk with God and we want to be high and good in faith um, and we have no desire to, uh, to disobey Scripture or to offend God, 
But oftentimes we allow our temporal matters to displace things of eternal worth. And that's what he's talking about here is you've got to focus on the eternal things and not the temporal things that we tend to worry about. We prioritize our work, our bank accounts, and all of those things. We prioritize those things, well, because they're front and center, right? Eternity's tomorrow. That's later, (laughs) but really it's not. And that's what he's trying to say is it's not. Eternity is now. Eternity has to be ever before us. That's why I always like it when we sing songs and we preach sermons about eternal, eternity, when we see his face, when, that day when we cross over that, that sea of glass. And that's, we need to keep those things in mind. If you read Second First and Second Peter, he continues to bear this out as the church was suffering such severe persecution. He kept saying, basically, uh, stay calm in the midst of the storm because this temporal experience is only for a moment that we will eventually put off this tent and we will be with him. And he is keeping something for us. He's keeping an inheritance for us. Uh, Reversing biblical procedures is common among people. According to Isaiah 55, We traffic in the trivial, spend our money for that which is not bread, and labor for that which does not satisfy. That's life. You can't take it with you, right? My dad said something one time, and it sticks with me, and as I was reviewing this lesson, uh, he said it would be an indictment against the church if when God came back we had a bank full of money and lost souls still unsaved. And you know, if you don't know my dad, he's pretty frugal. And to hear him say that was, wow. So we're not here to store up in our barns. We're here to save everybody that we can, no matter what the cost. So this is where trust becomes paramount to our success. Trust equals faith. So either we're going to trust God or we're going to trust our imagination, right? So without faith, it's impossible to please God. And uh, so we've got to walk by faith and not by sight, right? So I can see the problem in front of me, but I've got faith. I'm going to, this is what Paul talked about is taking captive your imagination, your thoughts, and your images, and the imagination of your minds, and you're going to say, you know what, I see this as the physical, but I'm going to imagine something in the supernatural. I'm going to imagine God making a way where there's no way. I'm going to imagine God splitting the sea. I'm going to imagine God walking on the water, calming the storm in my life, right? I'm going to imagine a healing. I'm going to imagine receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to imagine it. That's what Paul is talking about is taking your thoughts into captivity and every imagination. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding and acknowledge in all of your ways, acknowledge him. This is us seeking the kingdom of God. In all of our ways, acknowledge him and he will make He will then make the path straight. Don't worry about it. Which way should I walk? How should I go? Which job should I take? How am I going to make it to the end? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And in all of your ways, acknowledge God. How are we going to do that? Again, we're going to imagine God in every situation of our lives. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn from evil. It will be healing for your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Praise God. Forsaking the fountain of living water. Brother Kuhn says this. Forsaking the fountain of living water, which is God, and trying to dig out your own cisterns will only produce more thirst. Jeremiah 2 and 13, he's commented on that scripture. Abandoning 
our way and our thoughts and seeking God. These are the rudiments of salvation, and these are the, this is the foundation of inner peace, according to Isaiah 55. Abandoning our own thoughts and our own way and seeking after God's thoughts and his way is the, the way to have inner peace. Defining your own priorities is a sure route to defeat and failure. I'm going to define my own priorities. I'm going to make up my own list. No, I, I'm going to let God make my list. I'm not going to trust my thoughts and my, my own understanding. And uh, God's plan is always going to be uh, beneficial for me. It's going to be beneficial for me spiritually, and it's going to be beneficial for me physically. Because that's what he said, if you seek me spiritually, then all of the physical things that you worry about will be taken care of. And uh, I believe that. I believe the Word of God is true. And I believe that what God is saying is absolutely true. But I also believe it's hard sometimes to wrap our minds around that, right? Our Savior, Jesus Christ, ranked seeking the kingdom of God as first priority in our lives. Yet often we do ignore this gentle and kind and easy flowing statement, pushing it to the back of our minds as some kind of a future project. We do that a lot, don't we? When, when, when I get older, young, young boys or girls say, well, when I get married, then I'm going to have a relationship. Then we'll be a church people. Or when, when, I'm, when we get kids, then that's going to be. Well, when I get uh, retired, then I'm going to have, praise God. It's a future project. I'm going to have that great relationship with God when, when that day comes. No, 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 no. It's now, it's now, it's now, it's now. Today is the day. And uh, it's got to start right now. Praise God. I forget what they, the greatest day to uh, start a new project. Or what is that? I used to say? You say that often. Now I can't remember what I used to say. The best day to... Um, Start your successful walk with God was yesterday. But if you miss that, then it's today. <laughs> so I've, I've, I was tempted to do it, but it takes a lot of uh, resources and a lot of time. Has anybody ever seen the rock, pebble, sand, water illustration? We've done that. I've done that here. It was very powerful. And if you remember that, just bring that back into your mind. If you don't, I'll try to. I was actually going to show a video. I forgot to send it to the media. But uh, what you do is you take a glass jar, a pretty big glass jar, like this size, a vase or something, and you have rocks, big rocks, like two-inch rocks, then you've got pebbles, and then you have sand. And what you have to do is you put the rocks in, right, the big rocks in first, and uh, as, as you would do, I would have asked you, is, is, the, is it full? You fill it all the way up and... Normally, people would say, yes, that's full. And then you say, oh, but wait. Then you grab the, the small pebbles, and you pour the pebbles in. You shake it up, and then the pebbles fill from the bottom up. And then you ask, now is it full? And everybody, oh, yes, absolutely, it's full now, you know. Then you grab the sand, and you pour the sand in it, and you shake it about, and you keep filling it until the sand gets all the way. So now you've got the big rocks. You've got all the pebbles in there. And then you've got the sand filling every other square centimeter, and then you ask, is it full now? And, of course, you say, oh, yes, it's definitely full now. Then you get the water, and you fill that thing up, and it bubbles down, and you put more, and it bubbles down, and you put more until that thing is filled up all the way. Now is it full? Yes. The problem is, this is what we do is the only way you can fit all that in that jar is to do it in that exact sequence. If you try to put the water in first, then the sand, then the, you will have no room for the rocks, the big rock. There will be no room because it will fill up. Maybe you get two or three in there. And so what he's talking about here in this illustration, Stephen Covey used to do this a lot and when he was on tour I don't know, back in the 70s, whenever they wrote that book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, maybe it was the 80s. Um, he did this during his time management speech. Uh, he would bring somebody up from the audience, and they would go through this, the sequence. And he said, the big rocks are the priorities in life. These are the things that are most important to you. 
And this is, really goes back to the scripture. God says if you put those big things in first, all that other stuff is going to fit. It's going to be all right. But if you start adding all, the, if you start worrying about other things first, you will have no room for me. If you fear those images rather than the image of God, then I will be shut out of your life. So Christ's teaching is no way instructing us to abandon our responsibilities or our care for our families or ourselves, but that we should prioritize what is most important. So here we're going to debunk some erroneous teachings when people look at the Scripture and, and they say, well, the Bible says that you should forsake all care of your life 100% and then only just read the Bible. Spend your life in prayer. Um, some people would take that to an extreme or uh, literally almost and say, well, then uh, we are going to be like the early church and we're going to just have all things in common. We're just going to share everything. And um, uh, while that has that model was experienced by the early church, uh, it didn't prove itself to be a long lasting system that worked. Um, time has proven, I should say, that to be an unreliable system, whether among believers, Christians, or as a political philosophy. Some people, you may have recognized all things common in a, um, the political arena. They say, well, we want our fair share that only works, that only appeals to people that don't want to work. I want my fair share. Hey, he's got too much. I need, I need you to divide some of that up among us. That, that, the only people that like that are the people that don't want to work. And they're like, hey, I just want to sit back. And it's it, it, what that, that lifestyle creates is a welfare mentality. That, hey, I have a need, therefore you need to provide. Rather than the biblical view is that if you don't work, you don't eat. He, uh, coming against the people, the island people, I forget which island it was. I think it was Titus. He was pastoring island people. Um, I've never lived on an island, but I, I have heard that island people, they have their own time. They have their own agendas. They just, everything's just laid back. Very cool. They, they don't sweat the small stuff. Because um, it's all small stuff to them. And uh, apparently some of the ladies were getting very frustrated with their husbands because they had this mentality. And the, the husbands were like, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to go work today. I don't think I'm going to go fishing today. I'm going to take the day off. And to the point where Paul had to tell Timothy, that's not right. <laughs> you need to tell those guys to get up in the morning and go to work. If they don't work, they don't eat. And we're not going to be uh, enabling that mentality, basically. So that's when people say, well, the Bible says that we should all we should do is just uh, uh, share all of our wealth. And so uh, we can just read the Bible all day and. Or they'll say, take it to another extreme, and, and they'll say, well, we're going to separate ourselves from uh, society. We're going to deny fleshly desires. We're going to move out to some mountaintop somewhere and be, become monks and separate ourselves. And, and that's kind of taken that to the extreme. Uh, or there are other people that will be so um, inundated with Scripture and their, their walk with God that they really do... Um, they let themselves go. They become dirty, unkept, ungroomed, lazy, lacking in industry and production. And um, this is not the will of God either. That's not what he's talking about. God made us, he made mankind to be producers. And um, we're either going to become a devourer or we are going to become a contributor to society. There's only two choices. We are only going to devour. That means we're going to eat, 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 eat what everything is available, or we're going to become a contributor to. 
When God says, I want you to start looking at different insects and different animals of the world, he never said, consider the vulture. Consider the vulture. He just goes where there's roadkill. He goes where the lion, the predator, the predator hunted and worked hard and, and chased after and killed and, and uh, reaped the benefit of the reward, so to speak. Well, the vulture's just waiting back. I'm just waiting for the end. You do all the work, and we'll come in later. He didn't say that. He said, consider the ant. Consider the ant who works their entire lifetime storing up stuff for another generation. They store up food they'll never eat. He said, consider the ant. Oh, thou sluggard. Right? Consider the eagle as opposed to the vulture, right? The eagle flies high, soars, never eats dead flesh, always kills and eats what it kills. So this is God made us to become contributors, to be creators, right? Because we are made in his image. We should never judge people who have more of life's possessions than we have. And we, we can't say, and this is what people will do, well, if you're rich, that means that you're not seeking first the kingdom of God. And because I'm poor, that means that I do. No, that doesn't mean that either. So seekers of God's kingdom present many examples, or present, or, there are many examples in Scripture, I should say. So by pattering, pattering our patter, pattering, patterning, that's it, our lives after these examples in Scripture, we can determine our level and our degree and desire and devotion. Consider the Queen of Sheba. This woman sought out Solomon to hear his wisdom. Will we go to the same extent as her to seek out even one greater than Solomon, right? What about the disciples? These men forsook all and followed Jesus. Matthew and others deserted their own jobs and occupations to preach Christ's gospel. What cost is it that would be too great for us? This does not mean that everybody has to quit their job and the only people that have forsaken all and, and, and seek first the kingdom of God are the preachers who uh, are full-time. There are preachers that believe that. Some will believe that if you have a, what they, bivocational, that means you have a, a job and this job, then you're not quite, you haven't made it yet, right? Uh, the only problem with that is 90% of the pastors in the world are bivocational, uh, and they have to be. And I know the world thinks, they look at the guy with the jet. I wish, I wish they would just get rid of those guys. Just rem- They're not even, come on, they're not even, just because they carry a Bible with them doesn't mean that they're, come on. They can't, but that's the world, the atheists of the world. They see guys, and I know because I was that guy. I was the guy that thought every, every preacher was Benny Hen. Because that's all we see. Well, every preacher just wants money. They're only in it for the money until God gets a hold of you and calls you. And then you realize, here is, wow, there is no money here. <laughs> wow. And don't listen to that guy on TV. I don't make any money. No, we don't have it. I don't take a dime from the church. You know who I'm talking about. Don't listen to him. He's, I don't. I get all my money from donations and book sales. That's why I started writing books. Like, hey, if it worked for Joel Osteen, maybe he'll figure that out. I don't know. Praise God. <laughs> I'm waiting for that jet. I'm just waiting for a new truck. That's all. I don't want a jet. <laughs> I want one of them new fours like Dustin got. That's what I want. Anyway, this doesn't mean that everybody needs to quit their job in order to uh, seek the kingdom of God. In fact, I would say that there is no secular work when you are a born-again believer. There is no secular work. Once you become born again, everything in your life becomes spiritual. Everything in your life becomes God. Everything. And Paul told, what about Paul? He's another example. The Bible says that he counted all things that he had. He counted all the things that he lost as gain. 
to the knowledge of Christ. So uh, this is what an approach to look at. We, get, we look at all the things that we've lost. Uh, we talk about stock options a lot. We lost stock. We lost this. We lost that. We lost that. And I want you to understand that I don't feel like I lost one single thing. Because what did I gain? What else would I do? There's nothing else. When God got a hold of me and he apprehended me, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to apprehend that which has already apprehended me. And I'm like Paul. It doesn't matter what I gave up or what I've lost. I count it as a gain. It's an offering. I gave it to God. It's my tithe and my offering, and it's, it's, a, it's what I've laid on the altar for him. Is it enough? It's never going to be enough. How much more could I give? I'll give everything that I, but for, for what he's already given back to me is worth all of that. So whatever he asks, that's what Paul was saying. Hebrews chapter 11 catalogs men and women of faith from the dawn of human history who loved God and sought after him. No price was too great for them to pay. Oh, what a kingdom What a kingdom to invoke such desire. It's obvious from Christ's teachings that we could easily become preoccupied with the following things. Loving and serving other masters beside him. Other imaginations. Other outcomes. Right? Having food to eat. Providing something to drink. Being occupied with clothes. Being concerned with, uh, uh, being over concerned with our physical stature. If we're going to grow, am I pretty enough? Am I handsome enough? Worrying about our future. He talked about this. And he said this. Watch this. He said, this is what the Gentiles think about. But it wasn't like the Gentiles, like everybody who's a non-Jew. What he was talking about there is a mentality of worldliness. This is what a, the carnal man, the heathen, this is how they think. They're the ones that are chasing after the career. They're the ones that are chasing after that next dollar and, and that next promotion and that next thing. Now, I get it. We've got to make sure that we're successful. And that's where the first half of that book I wrote is about how to become successful, just period, in life. And, um, and we need that. We need to be successful in life. Number one, because uh, we, we want to be successful, we, we don't have to worry about money. We can become f- uh, f- financially uh, st- stable, I should, I would say, I'll use, uh, f- what is it, financially free, is that what, who, financial freedom, that's what uh, the, Dave Ramsey teaches that, and so you don't have to worry about those things, and if you can make enough money to make your ends meet, and still give to the church, and give to missions, and do all of those things, and give when God calls a special offering, that's what we need, okay, so you got to have a job that pays to do all of that, and you don't want to live above your means and beyond your means in order to, and so that becomes more worry and all of that. So we've got to be good stewards in all that we do, and we've got to seek after that. And another reason why you want to be successful in life as a Christian is because you're going to be a witness. People don't want to follow after people that don't, that are always in trouble, that are always having a financial problem. People want to follow after people that are successful. So that's another reason why you want to be, you know, successful in life. People are looking at you. So the question to ask is, if some other life form, I, I, somebody posed this question years ago, and I thought it was interesting. If there was aliens or whatever, and they came down and they infiltrated our society and they infiltrated your house, maybe put cameras or something in, and they just wanted to see you and see your life and who you were. They didn't know anything else about anything. They were just watching you from a bird's eye view. Would they know that you serve Jehovah, the King of Kings? Would they know that this guy seeks first the kingdom of God? This guy's got, this guy's different than everybody else. Yes, he goes to work every day. Yes, he's got to, but this is not the same. Or would we look like everybody else who has a side hobby? Well, those guys go to uh, golf on Sunday morning, and those guys go to that other little house, and they lift their hands and sing songs, and these guys go do their fishing. And would it feel, would it just to them just look like a hobby? Or would they say, wow, that's, that guy serves his God? 
materialism and man's pursuit of it has become the bane of, a, of the American society. Since we are inherently seekers of something, and we are, God made us seekers. Um, in fact, he called us. He put that, uh, somebody talked about this, was it that, at that meeting? God, uh, Brother Dross, I think, talked about this uh, Friday night. We went to that uh, Holy Ghost rally and that healing service in Lufkin. Brother Dross talked about that hole that God, it's that God-shaped hole that he puts inside every one of us. We're born with it. We, we didn't ask for it, but thank God he gave it to us because it's a seeking that we seek out God. We seek our creator, and that, uh, that happens to every one of us. That's, and people say, well, how do you prove that? Well, I can prove that through history because when people, when cultures did not know God, they still made a God. And they would throw that God away when, they, when that God didn't fulfill that hole. And then you will, most societies, when they don't worship Jehovah, they will have thousands of gods because none of them fill that void. Indians, are native, it doesn't matter. You go through all of history. The, the cave writings, all that, they're going to be worshiping something. If, if God did not put us put that inside of us, then we would just be well, basically worshiping ourselves. But that's not, so he's put that inside of us. In fact, Jesus said, no man come to the Father except the Spirit draws him. It's that seeking, it's that drawing. So, so we are, since we are inherently seekers of something, Satan has duped us and put all of these things in front of us, and Jesus coins this as the cares of life. There are things that will choke out your walk with God, and I'm going to tell you, it's not the devil. That, he talks about the devil's going to come and steal the word of God, and all of the, he talked about the stony ground. He talked about all this stuff, but I'm going to tell you what, as I've lived for God now for some time, I'm going to tell you that the cares of life is the number one thing that causes people to fall away from God. The cares of life. Death in the family, financial ruin, whatever it is, cares of life will cause people to just slip away. So what does seeking the kingdom of God look like? Well, set your affections on things above, the Bible says. Love, love God and the things of God more than everything else. And not just lip service, right? But you've got to love God and all of the things of God and the kingdom of God more than you love everything else. He says, uh, we've got to lay up our treasures in heaven. This can only be done by giving your time, giving money, giving your talents, giving all of those things, giving your heart to the Lord and to God's work and seeing God's work to be done. This goes back to why do we go to church? People will say that. They'll say, why do, why do I go to church if I can just get it at home? This COVID situation has created well, it created a tr tremendous revival for the apostolic church, so I'm not going to bad talk it. But there's one thing that it did create that I don't like, and that's the fact that people can watch it from home. And I will say, I can't watch it at home. It is not the same to me. <laughs> it, is, it is night and day to me. It's not even the same. It's apples and oranges to me. So when people say, ah, I just watch it at home, I'm like, well, I listen to podcasts all week, I, and I'm fed, and I, I can watch service, and I get a lot out of it, but it is not the same. And if you think it's the same, then you're not experiencing the same church that I am when I'm here. And so what, what, what does that mean? It means that all you do, if that's what you feel like, then, then all you're doing to come to church is you're sitting there, and you're watching a show. You're just perform for me, speak to me, minister to me. And when we're done, I'm going to go home. I'm going to show up, and I'm going to be fed, and I'm going to go home. That's not why I come here. I come here to feed. I come here to minister to people. I come here to serve God's purpose and to serve the kingdom of the Lord and, and say, God, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? I, I'm going to pray with people. I'm going to ask people what their needs are. Uh, I'm going to expect people to be healed. And, and you, you see what I'm saying? So there's, you can't do that on a TV screen. <laughs> uh, 
so you've got to understand that the purpose of God is more than just me being fed. It's how can I contribute? So either you're going to be a devourer or you're going to be a contributor in society and in the church. And I want to be a contributor because that's what God's called us to do. And that, I believe that is seeking the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is more than just you or just me. Praise God. Set a time, set some time uh, to engage in both physical and spiritual causes around your local church. Get involved. Where can I be plugged in? What can I do? She, she, the mentality of that person is not the person that can. You can't say that at home unless you give. If you're watching from home, go ahead and give. Push that buy button. You can do that from home. Um, but no, really, it, what if we just, oh, I just give my tithe. I just give my tithe. That's all I give. I wouldn't be satisfied with that. There's more. I mean, we got to give everything. So we got to take time to pray and fast, read our Bible, attend church, as, be- as well as being with your family and leading your family if you're a man of the house or you're the guardian of your home. So we got to respond if God calls us for special work, right? And no is not acceptable. Maybe when God calls us to do special work, you know, we say, no, that's not my ministry. That's just my flesh. Trust me <laughs> when I say, if God is, uh, if you're feeling like you are calling, being called to do something that your flesh does, that, that's not your flesh. That's a pretty good sign that it's God. Because your flesh would never do that. One guy, uh, what's his name? Tom Har- Hardy, Harden, Harden, Scott Harden. Scott Harden was walking out of a a grocery store one day, and God says, you need to go invite that girl that checked you out to church, the the checkout girl, not the girl that checked him out. You know what I mean? (laughs) And uh, and, and he's he's walking out of the building, and he's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And God said it again, go invite that girl to church. And he said, oh, that's just my flesh. And God said, no, pretty sure your flesh would not be telling you to do this. And he turned right back around. He said, I'm sorry, but I need to invite you to come to church. Praise the Lord. Anyway, I'll never forget that. If your flesh is telling you that, it, yeah, your flesh want, doesn't want to do it, that's, that's probably God. So here's what we say is we say, no, it's not my ministry. No, I'm uncomfortable. But rather than that, we should say, how? That's all. That's a good question. But not no. But God's calling you to do something. You say, well, then how? I don't feel like I have the ability to do that. I don't, like Moses, right? Moses said, I don't, how am I going to do that? I don't have a voice there anymore. I don't have a, I have no influence at all in Egypt. Who's going to listen to me? And God says, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. I am who I am. That's, 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 that's the answer to the question. <sighs> Live for God and nothing else. There ought to be nothing Never make it a habit to forsake church for work. That's a habit. Don't make it a habit to forsake church for work, to forsake church for family, to forsake church for school. To we, people's like, well, you don't understand. It's school. Yeah, I get it. We've had truant officers come to our door because we were apostolic church people. And they came up, the cop came up to our door, knocked on the door, and I'm like, what in the, I looked at Sally, what in the world did you do? <laughs> and he, he knocked on the door, and he said, is Susanna Whitaker here? And I thought, how old was she? Eight? Nine? Nine years old? I'm like, what did you do? <laughs> she literally, literally, if you walked out our front door, her school was two houses down. The gate to her school was right there. You could see the school. She had no excuse. I mean, no excuse not to go to school. But she had missed so much school 
that the teachers or whoever called the cops. And so they came up and said, where is she? She was actually in the yard. I thought, well, she's right there. That's her. <laughs> That's the perpetrator. <laughs> What's the problem, officer? He says, well, I'm, I have school called. I need to make sure she's okay. She's missed a lot of school. And I just said, sir, we're apostolic. And she, uh, we have church all the time. She goes Bible quizzing. That's Fridays. We got to go in tournaments. And um, she's, she misses a lot. And I told him, I said, she, it's right there. It's not like she can't walk over. It's, it's, I said, but, you know, sometimes we stay out late with church stuff, and we're, she's just not going to get up. We're not going to make her go. But she never missed a day at church. Oh, well, you, wait, you stayed out too late at school doing a school function, baby. We're not going to make you go to school church today. No, sir. No, 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 no. You pulled an all-nighter. It's all right. Get changed. Let's go. You're going to church. Sleep on the pew. We don't care, but you're going to go to the house of the Lord. That was the day we realized we are not public school people. No, because you can't, because we had to choose. Either we're going to send our kids to public school or we're going to do what we send our kids to church. I'm telling you, seek first the kingdom of God and all of those other things will be added unto you. Hey, she figured out how to read on her own. I don't know how she did it. I'm messing with Sally now. It's Sally, she trained him well. That's, let's stand together. Didn't she do a good job with the kids? Who needs public school? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hey, God, we love you. We ask you, Lord God, that you would help us today to fear you and to imagine all the supernatural possibilities that could happen in our lives. We put our faith and our trust in you and you alone, and we give you all praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. Hey, time for a coffee maybe.